Good afternoon, everyone. This is T3 Live Editor-in-Chief John Darcy here to bring you the daily recap. So what we had here today was just your typical OPEX quiet Friday. Uh, you had some gyrations in the market, but oftentimes on OPEX Friday, those are a result of pinning and the type of action that doesn't uh, follow along with normal technical analysis type stuff. So I, I commented earlier on Twitter that it's funny to see everyone try to rationalize every move that happens in the market. That happens always, but especially on OPEX Friday, you have some people out there tweeting and talking about, you know, regular technical analysis as it applies to moves in, in stocks today. But really, it's these OPEX Fridays are days that traders tend to steer away from because of the peculiar uh, pinning type action that doesn't adhere to normal technical analysis rules. So uh, we had a typical, you know, in factor in the fact that you're in the middle of August, a typically quiet time in the market, and you had a recipe for a slow drift type day, which is exactly what we got. You take a look at the chart of the S&P. Uh, we'll look at the spiders. What do you have today's data? Hold on just a second here. We found our footing after yesterday's sell-off. You know, we had the first uh, two-day-in-a-row triple-digit losses in the Dow uh, the last two days since June. So it's something to take note of. June obviously wasn't that uh, long ago, but uh, more weakness than we've seen since then. Uh, but yesterday we, or today we found our footing. Uh, I wouldn't put too much significance in today, into today's action, like I said, uh, whether it was strong or weak. You know, it's pretty indifferent right now, but I think the, the real follow-through, the real signs you'll see are next week to see whether we follow through to the downside additionally or whether uh, we do get some sort of bounce leading up into that uh, Fed September potential QE tapering rate decision. But uh, the real interesting thing right now is all the headlines are about the Fed and will they taper in September, blah, blah, blah. And what we're really getting is a ton of mixed signals regarding whether or not the FOMC is going to do the infamous QE tapering. Um, I'll go through a whole list of things. For example, this week uh, we had some strong data. And strong economic data, the theory is that strong data means that the Fed will be more inclined uh, to taper and to decrease their QE purchases. Uh, so you had that narrative. And then we had Bernanke come out following some data that came out, and he basically said that Weakness in the labor market is understated, uh, basically saying that the labor market is a lot worse than some of the data suggests. Uh, he also said that inflation is decreasing, which is not something they want to see. Uh, the Fed has been targeting certain levels of inflation that haven't really been hit, and they especially don't want to see inflation go down. So both of those comments from Bernanke would suggest that he's more dovish and less inclined to taper QE than I think the market is somewhat pricing in over the last few days. Um, then you had uh, John Hilsenrath, who is the Federal Reserve's mouthpiece, basically, with the Wall Street Journal, come out and say he actually thought that Bernanke's comments were hawkish. He thought that uh, it was basically Bernanke was saying that, yeah, they could taper QE, but rates are going to stay ultra low for a long-term uh, period of time. Uh, so you had you know, competing voices. Usually Hills and Rath is, like I said, a mouthpiece of the Federal Reserve in the Wall Street Journal. So it was interesting to see those, uh, the, the comments from Bernanke and the comments from Hills and Rath sort of uh, cross paths a little bit. And then you had the reaction from the market would tell you that there's a little bit of mixed signals going on about whether or not the QE is going to taper. For example, you have bonds uh, are weakening. You have the TLT. We can take a look at the chart of the TLT uh, to give you an example of that. The TLT is fading, which would suggest that the market is pricing in expectations of QE tapering and higher rates. Um, and then you also have gold sending the opposite signal. So you take a look at the chart of GLD. The biggest price driver, bullish price driver for gold is QE tapering. So strength in gold would tell you that the market believes in what Bernanke said, that, that the market is interpreting his comments as dovish, interpreting his comments as we're not as likely to taper in September as most people think. So you know, I just listed about six or seven things right there that you go back and forth, and they're telling you different things regarding whether or not the market expects uh, the, the Fed to taper in September. So, you know, you follow along with the headlines, you try to get a pulse on that type of stuff, but right now it's really hard, both based on comments that we're seeing in the media and the market's reaction to different comments. And you have another example. You have something I talked about in last night's recap is that if the Fed does taper and we're heading for a higher rate environment in the future, uh, the safety, defensive, high-yield dividend sectors like the utilities are the biggest example of that, and then consumer staples is another one. Uh, the XLU, we'll take a look at the chart of that. I said last night that I expect, you know, as we do expect to get some tapering either in September or beyond, that sectors like the utilities, the XLU, 
are likely to underperform. And today we got more underperformance from the XLU. Actually, some acceleration to the downside in this sector, a break below the 200 day moving average. You know, talking about that theme from last night, it really held true today in what was a quiet market. So, something really to take note of. And that's another signal on the side of people are expecting QE tapering because people are starting to pile out uh, more of those dividend defensive, high dividend yield type stocks that are less attractive in a high uh, bond yield environment. So the theme of that, a lot of mixed signals. Uh, yeah, we try to get a pulse in the headlines, but you really have to obey price action right now. And uh, next week will be very interesting. Could be very quiet next week as we wait for more indications on the, the Fed QE potential taper, but uh, just some thoughts there. Uh, taking a look at some individual names, I mean, like I said, it's a Friday OPEX day, so most traders tend to shy away from this type of day. I, I was just out on the trading floor. I was going to go talk to a few guys and get some ideas for stocks to talk about in the recap and things like that. And I go out there and there's like two people on the trading floor and they're both watching YouTube videos. So that tells you about how interested traders are right now in trading this tape. Uh, really a snoozer today, but you just got to look at stocks that are holding up well after recent strength. Uh, if you're looking on the long side, and a perfect example of that is Apple. Uh, it's really changed character over the last week, two weeks uh, since earnings. And you had you know, a couple big names jump in this week and add some confidence to that equation. You had Carl Icahn with his infamous tweet now uh, where he said that he initiated a big stake in the stock. And you had Leon Cooperman of Omega Advisors uh, come in and say that he's increasing his stake and he really likes Apple. So you had uh, some people come in. They're buying. Yes, it could have contributed to the bullish price action in uh, Apple over the last month, two months. But the significance is more so they are adding a lot of confidence for Apple investors that were a little bit wary of the fact that the stock and the company had fallen a little bit on hard times, uh, relatively speaking, of course, still a $500 billion market cap company. But you know, I, I expect to see Apple continue higher from here. The action over the last three days would uh, would help that thesis because it's held up really well after that big move, shown no signs of wanting to pull back in sharply. It's back above all of its moving averages now. It's really positive action there. Uh, Facebook is a slightly different story because it, it's been weak over the last week or two, uh, or basically over the last week since that really strong move after earnings. Obviously, it went up 40 plus percent after that transformative earnings report where they show that they're really starting to solve the mobile equation. Uh, we got a bunch of lines here that probably Scott drew, a big line guy. But uh, Facebook found some footing yesterday at the 50% Fibonacci retracement level uh, from the gap and go. So you, you know you draw your Fibonacci's is something we teach in the Active Trader course, uh, and you can see we got to bounce off that 50% level, which is sort of the line in the sand if you want the stock in the short term to maintain bullish composure. Uh, and I'll get rid of this just so we can see the chart better now, but. That's a level that people were watching, whatever. You can still see the chart a little bit. Uh, Facebook, I think this one is poised to get back towards highs. I really do. I think that, that earnings gap and go was so disruptive that it really flipped the psychology of Facebook on its head. Whereas before, you couldn't trust it after multiple day rallies to continue to the upside. I think now you can trust dips. I think institutions are increasingly going to be looking for exposure long. The institutions love playing stocks that have a narrative. And right now, mobile is a huge narrative that institutions are looking to get exposure to. And Facebook, for the longest time, was not part of that narrative. They were actually the opposite. They were someone that, yes, they have a lot of web traffic and all that, but they are, they've been unable to solve the mobile conundrum. And this earnings report flipped that on its head, and it sounds like they have some stuff in the pipeline that's really promising. Not only are they uh, finding success with putting ads in people's news feeds, they're able to charge higher fees for, uh, they're talking about putting video ads in your news feed that could potentially add $6 billion in revenue by 2020. That was a Morgan Stanley estimate. Uh, and they're also talking about, or they are launching a mobile payments uh, platform. Mobile payments is a huge trend as well that a lot of startups are trying to get into. So they're trying to uh, create a mobile payment system that will rival PayPal. Basically, you can sign into your Facebook and uh, your, your credit card and stuff is stored there so you can more seamlessly pay for things on your mobile device just by using uh, your Facebook account that's, that's linked to your mobile. So. A few things in the pipeline for Facebook to make it seem like they're starting to really figure things out aside from just the bullish price action that we've seen. My point is I think you can trust this on dips at key levels, yes. Fibonacci uh, retracement levels are an example of that, something we teach in the Active Trader course. Uh, so Facebook, I, could, I expect to see it continue to the upside next week. That is, barring 
1987 market crash like some people are talking about, which is a bunch of nonsense. But a uh, couple other things. Another interesting point to note, or actually I'll, I'll talk about Tesla first. Tesla is a stock that obviously has been a darling of the market over the last few months. Uh, we, I first started talking about it in the 40s when it had that 50% short float. I said this is poised for a big move. I didn't think it was poised to go up to $150 a share. Full disclosure there, uh, you know, I thought big float, a really compelling story with the CEO, Elon Musk, now that he's a household name. Uh, but, and obviously they're doing big things in terms of revolutionizing the auto industry. But uh, Tesla is one that has been a little bit quiet recently, but I expect it after bouncing off the 21-day moving average today to get a little bit more interest potentially. Uh, you know, we talk about the 8 and 21 days, your sh uh, gauges of short-term composure. Tesla yesterday bounced off that 21-day moving average, closed a little bit off its highs yesterday, but continued overnight, gapped up, but it was quiet during the session. This 8-day moving average is curling down now, so you have a, a tight little range here now to, get, to gauge your short-term composure for Tesla. Uh, you have support now at the 21-day moving average, and you have a little bit of resistance here uh, at the 8-day potentially, so next week's action will be crucial. You can use those two levels as your points of reference in terms of managing risk on that trade. Uh, and the other the thing I was going to talk about, a more thematic type thing, is we've seen Europe really emerge over the last month and outperform other world markets significantly. It's one thing that Barron's actually got right. It was their cover. And various other people have talked about this potential theme uh, about Europe maybe emerging from the, the ashes a little bit and starting to catch up to other world markets. Obviously, you know, you had the huge run in Japan this year and a lot of volatility there. You've had really great performance in U.S. markets. Uh, and China's also found its footing a little bit, but sort of the forgotten continent uh, was Europe because they have all of their European debt crisis stuff and uh, tons of challenges for them to work through, but it seems like all of that's calmed down a little bit. Uh, bond yields have, have fallen in key countries that were, that were really struggling. Uh, and, you know, they've been able to find their footing and, and get some interest again. And the VGK is the ETF that you can track European markets. So you go to VGK, we can take a look at that chart. Acting really well. You know, people <laughs> talking fear-mongering in the U.S. about potential crash and this and that. I think some people perceive Europe is, is less overheated, obviously, than U.S. markets or even something like Japan. Uh, and it's sort of basing up here at a key level. Uh, we can zoom out a little bit just so you get some perspective on that. We'll even go to the monthly to get a good look. You see, you know, U.S. markets trading at all-time highs and extending and overheated and all that. Europe's bounce back from the financial crisis really hasn't been all that potent. Yes, the VGK ETF has doubled since 2009, but uh, you look in the context of the broader chart, not the snapback that you've seen, excuse me, in uh, some other world markets, and you're seeing sort of a little perk above a monthly base here that could take you back if you're talking about resistance levels and technical analysis up here to around... Uh, 56, 57 on the VGK. Uh, and, and in particular, I think there's a lot of opportunities to play individual stocks in Europe. Uh, you know, exposing yourself to a broad ETF like this, there's not a ton of potential upside. A lot of people that are in the stock market, they're looking for bigger winners and, and more compelling individual stories. A stock that I love that it does have some correlation to broader European markets, but uh, Siemens. Uh, it's a German company. You know, if you want to play Europe, Germany is obviously a place you want to be involved with because they have a rock solid economy and all that. But Siemens trades at a significant discount uh, to a lot of its peers uh, in its industry niche, uh, like an IBM or something like that. But you take a look at the chart of SI, Siemens. And people have been asking me on Twitter and things like that when I've expressed my bullish thesis on Europe. They say, what are some individual names you like there? And Siemens is one that I do really like. Uh, you know, it had this gap down on this day, but it was able to recover from it, bouncing off the lows. So it's, it's got a upper level flag here that's intact based on a snapback we saw from a big gap down. I believe that was on earnings for Siemens. It did hold its 200 day moving average. And you zoom out on that one, a compelling little setup. It looks a lot like the VGK. Like I said, it's correlated to uh, broader European markets, which I'm bullish on. But I think this is an interesting name, a nice little dividend yield, uh, a good solid company in, in the most rock solid country in Europe. So just wanted to throw in one stock in Europe after talking about that European thesis, something that doesn't get covered a lot here. That's not really on Scott's radar and not really his approach. Uh, he's obviously a, mainly a technical guy, short-term guy, focusing on high beta stocks in U.S. markets. But uh, that's about it for today's daily recap. You know, like I said, it was hard to really come up with a cogent thesis 
uh, in terms of forming an opinion on the market in today's recap, because not only is today an OPEX Friday, it's the middle of August, slow trading. You have this big announcement that everybody's waiting on in September that's really you know, got everybody in pause right now and uh, sort of in neutral. Uh, so, and like I said, you're getting all kinds of mixed signals both in the headlines and in the reaction to various headlines about whether the QE taper is priced in or not. So it'll be very interesting to see that announcement. I'm leaning towards the camp that I think uh, I'm not sure they're going to taper in September, to be honest with you. I think at some point this year, in December maybe they could do it. Uh, but I think, as Bernanke said himself, you want to you know, get indications from the horse's mouth, the data really isn't as good as it might appear on some levels. Uh, the participation rate in the labor force is really, really low. Unemployment rate is hugely misleading. We've had some decent jobs reports, but the, the gains in the jobs market is just not anywhere near where they would want it to be if they're going to start pulling back on this uh, really easy money, uh, dovish monetary policy. So I think if there's going to be a surprise in September, I think it could be that they don't taper. But uh, you know, that's, it's really a coin flip at this point. I have no intel on that, obviously. Uh, so just, just my opinion on that matter. But anyways, go out and enjoy the weekend. It's supposed to be a beautiful weekend in New York City. Uh, I'm headed out to Montauk to go fishing with the boys tomorrow. So excited about that. Never been to Montauk. I'm a southern native, so I haven't explored these parts a ton. But uh, I'm going off on a tangent now. What I'm saying is enjoy this beautiful weekend. Uh, slow summer trading. This has been John Darcy for your Daily Recap. Have a good one. I'm Evan Lazarus, Chief Knowledge Officer for T3Live.com. You don't become a great trader by watching videos and taking courses. You become a great trader through live screen time. Accelerate that learning curve by tapping into the experience of seasoned professionals. Currently, we're offering five-day free trials to each of our four mentoring rooms. In the mentoring rooms, we teach our strategies in the context of the live market. To sign up for a free trial, go to the T3Live education page, fill out the form, and get started when the next trading session begins. We hope to see you in one of our mentoring rooms.